All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm uh, Dave Bappert with Johnson & Johnson. Um, I guess a lot of people probably have heard of Johnson & Johnson as a healthcare company. Uh, a lot of people may or may not be aware we are actually uh, the number one healthcare company. We have rated the top 10 most admired companies to work for. Uh, we are the top pharma uh, most admired company to work for. We are also the uh, number one, apparently the happiest company to work for. I don't know when that survey came out, but apparently that is, that is true. We even have a picture around it. Even in the supply chain design magazine that is out there, we were the runner up in uh, one of the most agile supply chain. Um, before I go into the presentation and show a short clip of J&J, when you think of J&J, how many of you guys think of product innovation? By just show of hands. A few, yeah. And then uh, when you think of J&J, how many of you think of technology innovation company? Actually, three more than what I thought I would see. <laughs> but, okay. So, um, I guess we are known for product uh, innovation. We are known for serving our patients and our customers. Um, technology innovation is not something that comes to mind first when people think of J&J. But this presentation, what we are going to talk about is how we are kind of investing in technology, not just product technology, information operation, engineering, and supply chain technology to improve our footprint and to serve our customers and patients in a much faster and a better way. So overview of Johnson & Johnson. Um, do I click on the first video or how do I do that? When J&J &J began, there were about one billion people on the planet. Today, our company serves one billion people every day, all over the world, at every stage of life with the most advanced medicines treating hepatitis, HIV, various forms of cancer and other medical conditions. We are the world's largest medical device manufacturer with innovations in orthopedics and surgery, as well as vision care, diabetes care, and a broad range of consumer health care products. Every day, the Johnson & Johnson supply chain earns trust with quality and reliability in those moments when it matters most. Fast changes in healthcare and technology are driving a revolution. We've responded by transforming our supply chain into the engine that helps drive J&J's innovation portfolio. From customer interaction and demand sensing, to 3D printing, to innovations in highly regulated manufacturing and streamlined delivery, we are driven by global need and inspired by our credo to widen the boundaries of what is possible. And we are there with our R&D and commercial partners and more than 60,000 people, more than 350 distribution centers globally, filling over 100,000 orders a day with our 350,000 SKUs in nearly any hospital operating room, retailer, pharmacy, and in millions of homes around the world. J&J &J is there with a supply chain that looks at healthcare end to end, striving to serve the next two billion people and earn their trust one customer at a time. So that actually gives you the lay of the complexity. If I switch to the presentation model. I guess in the interest of time, I, I guess maybe we can skip the second video. That was more around the uh, digital partnership that we have. How many of you have heard of the company called Verb Surgical? So what we have done uh, with, uh, in partnership with Google is uh, j, j is great at product technology, understanding the disease and providing technologies to kind of eliminate the disease state or address the disease state. CEO, um, Verb Surgical. Yeah. Okay, if it's working, then I'll let them. Johnson & Johnson and Google approached me about joining them as the CEO of Verb Surgical. The pitch was, hey, you're gonna be a well-funded startup. You're not gonna have to worry about capital. You're not gonna have to worry about technology. You're gonna have to worry about changing the world. 
I'm Scott Hennigan, CEO of Verb Surgical. We're all about making the surgeon better. Today, there's 10 to 20 million surgeries a year on around the world. But only 5% are done robotically, and we believe that number should be 75, 80, 90%. We're very action-oriented. We want to take actions that, that change the world. And what better word than verb between a noun and a direct object? And that's where we were going to sit. We were going to sit between the surgeon and the patient. With robotics, the advanced visualization, advanced instruments, all of the machine learning, trying to make every surgeon great and give them the tools to be great so they can deliver great to that patient. Yeah, very. There's all the robotics and all the hardware to have surgical arms that can be controlled by a surgeon with instruments that go minimally invasively inside of your body to do surgery throughout the body. We're developing advanced visualization systems, algorithms, machine learning around what you're seeing. So also, whether you're on your phone or whether you're at your PC, as a physician, you can actually do preoperative planning. You can do the procedure ahead of time through simulation, just like an autopilot in a plane. And data analytics fits into this whole category of giving the patient as well as the clinician all the information they need. So that whole thing becomes a, a solution. For me, that all starts with people. We created this phrase at the very beginning that said, are you a verb? That was the most important thing to us is, are you a verb? What did it mean to be a verb? For us, it meant you had to be someone who was passionate about the mission that we were embarking on. You had to be someone who wanted to create this future of surgery. We're gonna impact millions and millions of lives. We're gonna push surgery forward. We're gonna bring technology to surgeons so they can do things they couldn't do before. We're gonna make shorter recovery times. It's not winning in the market that gets me excited. It's getting this technology, these potential clinical outcomes to every patient around the world and expanding the number of patients that can have access to it. What we call democratizing surgery, you know, around the world. That's, that's our goal. Okay, sorry. All right, so as you heard, uh, j, j is a fairly large, fairly complex company. We have, as you said, more than 350,000 SKUs. Uh, when I first joined j, j a couple of years ago, we also were fiercely decentralized. We had 120 ERP systems and uh, we have more than 110 manufacturing sites. And we probably have lost initially when we came in, we didn't even have a count of the MES and financial systems that were in place. Uh, we generally have a presence in more than 100 countries as well. So to make sure that you have the right product at the right place for the right patient and the right doctor or the right parent, as our credo suggests, is a very complex task, um, as you can imagine. So that's where you see a lot of legacy supply chain uh, type behavior in JNJ. But over the past, since almost 2007, we have started significantly transforming our supply chain from a change management perspective. And that has also just started to deliver some results, which is what we wanted to showcase today. So I'll skip this slide in the interest of time. But if you heard our credo, basically, uh, our goal is to strengthen our customer trust and with one customer at a time. The whole concept at j, &J is around servant leadership. You want to make sure that you do the right thing supply chain wise to enable uh, the business to sell the products to the customer and then eventually good things happen to you. Um, the focus is significantly on strategy but also on execution with excellence because the room for error in j, &J especially in your pharma and medical devices, can be a life improved versus a life not improved. And in consumer, it's mostly around a lost sale more than anything else.
So our focus today, I think uh, when Mike and I discussed, we wanted to uh, kind of uh, share a couple of things. One is, since the big thrust of this uh, forum was on um, advanced uh, analytics and automation, we thought we would share first on the whole digitalization, but then we also talk about advanced analytics and then talk about a use case where we have kind of tried, tried to do both together and the results that we are starting to see there. So in terms of um, where we are, right, what's our vision to achieve digitalization? We know that augmented reality, robotics, artificial intelligence, they are the new in things, and um, the whole notion of Industry 4.0 is around connecting different technologies seamlessly to enable improvement of our supply chain. So the way JNJ is responding to this is not taking a decision in isolation. What we are trying to do is combine a couple of things together. One around focusing on our smart factories by looking at automating factories wherever we deem fit, and we'll talk about what we mean by wherever we deem fit. Then looking at our smart supply chain, truly historically JNJ was a decentralized company, but over the past couple of years we have started looking truly at end-to-end -end supply chain. One thing to notice, and I kind of found that in the supply chain digest as well, when we say supply chain, supply chain definitions are also slightly different in different companies. Within Johnson & Johnson, supply chain is uh, planning, sourcing, manufacturing, distribution and logistics, quality, design to value, and launch management. All of it is under a part of supply chain. So it is truly end-to-end -end when we say we need to look at an end-to-end -end supply chain. And then we need to build capabilities across our value chain to kind of harness the power of data analytics and actually deliver value to the supply chain, which in turn delivers value to our customers. And we need to invest in the latest technologies to maintain our healthcare status. And again, we need to invest in latest technologies where we deem fit. So here are the four areas where we started working on together. Smart solutions, as I said, focus on smart factories and smart capabilities. Uh, smarter supply chain. Uh, we are significantly investing in um, the building blocks around advanced analytics and end-to-end -end visibility. As was shared uh, earlier in one of the presentations, uh, I think Janice said visibility drives performance and performance drives improvements. That's the area that we are looking at as well. And we are also piloting smart factories that are highly automated and at the same time have high use, uh, asset utilization uh, and then we are also investing in customized productions. And there are some use cases that we talk of, that we can talk about. Like if you look at legacy consumer businesses that were big tanks and big reactors, now we are looking at newer technologies for continuous mixing and concentrate mixing, where instead of having 10 ton tanks, we might have 10 meter pipes that can then uh, mix up the things together pretty fast. Similarly, in our pharma business as well, again, large reactors, we are moving away from that into a single piece flow, which is fairly difficult in a um, large molecule type industry. So this slide is a little bit complex, but the idea there is the whole notion that everything is linked together, and hence JNJ's approach is that we don't typically take one thing in isolation at a time. So as an example, if you want to talk about additive manufacturing, which is the whole notion around 3D printing, the way it works is there is a technical group that determines the technical feasibility of additive, manu additive manufacturing. Then our group determines the supply chain feasibility of that same technology. Because in some cases, legacy technology from a supply chain return on invested capital is still much better given the current technology constraints. And if they pass that hurdle, then we can start looking at, OK, how do we now do a batch size of one instead of larger batch sizes? And then how we can then do a dynamic network configuration here. A perfect case example in this case is uh, some of our businesses that are related to accident and trauma. In many cases, when you are in a pharma or medical devices, you have certain degree of lead time before you can react. But the accident trauma business is such that you rarely have enough lead time. You cannot predict accidents in a great extent. So if you are looking at a knee replacement or a hip replacement, you generally get a week or two worth of lead time. You can do a few things. But when you are in an accident, your doctor really needs those products right away. And he or she does not have the time 
to look at the human anatomy and try out different parts. So that's where we are looking at now, changing the footprint so that we can deliver in batch sizes of one and dynamically reconfigure our network depending on where the product is, where we can source using 3D printing instead of this the legacy supply chain where everything was produced in a single facility, shipped to a single warehouse, and from there shipped across the entire network. So how do we do it? I think uh, Mike uh, uh, alluded to that earlier, right? If you're, the first slide showed us that we have uh, roughly around 110 manufacturing facilities. Some are 25 years old, some are 25 months old. But to change the technology to digitize the entire 110 manufacturing facility network is physically impossible because by then the technology would have changed on us again. So the way we are doing it is we are doing a two-pronged approach here. We have an intelligence and deployment unit which looks at our legacy systems and looks at them from an efficiency and supply chain feasibility perspective. And we are then determining where exactly do we apply the new technologies. We conduct a pilot and then we conduct a deployment plan. But then what we call as a futures unit, this is the unit that also looks at new and emerging technologies from a product and operational technology perspective and where we can pilot them. The whole change management approach here is the whole notion of rapid prototyping, failing fast, and learning fast from it. It's something that the futures group is more focused on. Uh, historically, that's not something that pharma or healthcare companies used to place their bets on to give a couple of thousands of dollars, see if it works, and then if it works, then scale it up. Generally, the, I mean, those companies for all the right regulatory reasons were generally risk covers. That is not to say that we are extreme risk takers. That is just to say that within the regulatory confines, we are starting to explore different technologies through this futures unit. And then the other approach is, uh, what we are trying to do is, we are doing a merging of our bottoms up and top down. And what we mean by that is, Generally, strategically, we need to sell the capability to the senior leadership. That's the best avenue to get the funding. But in order for us to execute, two things absolutely need to happen. The middle management needs to see the benefit of it. But at the same time, when you want to link and clearly grasp the benefits of all your digitization, um, you need to start from the bottom. If you have the right information at the production equ equipment, that will then make you improve your production, which will then make you improve your plant, which will then make you improve your supply chain. So when we are doing the investment planning, we get the approval from the top. When we do the actual um, road mapping, we work with the middle level management because they are the front line, they see the benefit. But when we do the actual deployments, we make sure we start from the bottom up. Now, the last point that I wanted to make, this is a bit of a busy slide. Uh, here are the different technologies where we are working on merging the digitalization with our supply chain advanced analytics. But if you look at this standard plant, and uh, I have kind of um, generalized it a little bit, but here is where the whole notion of advanced analytics works really well with digitalization. So what we are doing, in one of our plants is we are truly looking, first of all, end-to-end. -end. Generally, I think there was a presentation earlier around uh, that uh, Mary gave around the strategic, operational, and tactical there. We actually use the Gartner framework of strategic, tactical, and operational. I know those names keep on changing. But the way we looked at it here was from a simultaneous optimization perspective, generally it's not new that a true end-to-end -end supply chain optimization is better than optimizing individual nodes. What is new is now we have the data and the technology engines and the optimization engines that can solve multiple trade-offs simultaneously. So what we are trying to do is determine which facility do we need to, uh, which product do we need to produce where, and what is the right batch size, batch sequence, all those good things, and how do we merge that with our transportation mode. So that's the first level of analytics. We then pull it back to digitalization, where within that manufacturing, currently it's mostly in the four walls of manufacturing, where we have the right sensors that continuously tell us our plant performance, and based on the plant performance, how then do we adjust our batching and our transportation, because there is a strong linkage to it, 
so that our supply chain costs remain the same or better, but our service level continues to improve. So that's an example where we are working together. Uh, and actually, uh, that is to a point where it has already started delivering results, where the concept of digitalization and advanced analytics works together and delivers better value than doing each individually in silos. And I guess that was my last presentation. The other thing is we are looking at different partnerships because we know that uh, in this space, j, j is not the leader. This may or may not even be j, j s core competency to be the supply chain analytics leader. But there are companies that are um, in that arena, either from a strategic perspective, McKinsey, Gartner, Accenture, or from an analytics perspective. And we strongly believe that universities are a better hub of digitalization and analytics. So we have a bunch of university partnerships as well. Our data science team also has co-investment and co-development partnerships with some of the uh, mostly simulation modeling and uh, optimization engine companies. Uh, and uh, one such company, I think we are going to be on the panel, who is working with us on uh, manufacturing. I think that's also a great example where a 155-year-old company is working with probably a 15-month-old company where, where we are working together uh, to make sure that they bring the right advanced analytics capabilities from manufacturing perspective, but we give them the right subject matter expertise from a product technology perspective. I think that was my last slide. Thank you.